This is called a recirculating aquaculture system. It's important to make a distinction between small scale, small scale sustainable aquaculture and big scale aquaculture, which is, is sort of the equivalent of factory farming. That's what, not where we want to go. We're talking about doing this on a very small scale and recycling the water that the fish are actually in, using their wastes, in fact, as a nutrient for plants, which is the goal of the recirculating, recirculating aquaculture system, which is what we have right here. This is actually taken in upstate New York in December inside of a greenhouse, and we were able to maintain you know, a fair level of greenery even, even when it was quite cold outside. But basically what's happening here is we're raising fish in this pond, and the water gets pumped up through a series of food-grade 55 gallon barrels. It's very important to always use food-grade barrels if you're going to do this. You want to make sure they didn't contain any sort of petrochemicals in them. And basically what's happening is that bacteria that live on the surface area of the gravel and on the roots of the plants convert the wastes produced by the fish, something called ammonia, into something called nitrate, which is actually a nutrient for plants. So plants that are growing in this system grow like gangbusters. We have watercress growing in there, which is a great spicy green, and duckweed, and you can actually take the duckweed and just throw it back into the fish tank and they'll eat it again. So, um, <laughs> we, I have raised tilapia in Texas. Tilapia are a fish that you see commonly in a lot of restaurant menus, but they're a tropical fish. And the thing is, they will die if the temperature drops below 55 degrees, which is actually fairly difficult to maintain in the higher latitudes without a lot of energy inputs. Um, so we've been focusing on cold weather tolerant species that also eat close to the bottom of the food chain, like catfish and um, carp, actually. We've been working with a lot. Um, that is a top here right there. That's a bullhead. Um, we are big advocates. Oh, sorry, they're kicking. We're really into raising what we call micro-livestock, which are basically animals that are smaller than a cow, or a sheep, or a goat, or a pig. They weigh a lot less, they eat a lot less, they poop a lot less, they compact the ground a lot less. Uh, unlike, these, unlike large animals. So what would include? What, what are micro-livestock? Well, turkeys, um, chickens, ducks, uh, even guinea pigs, rabbits, um, all eat much less, and those factors combined make them far more appropriate to have in an urban environment. My favorite thing about raising chickens in the city is the fact that you don't ever have to buy food for them. Which we were talking about earlier about all the food waste that is thrown away. Chickens are just fabulous omnivores. They are not particular about what they'll eat. They'll eat everything from food scraps to... Um, we live right around the corner from a, a microbrewery that every week throws out just barrels full of uh, spent barley hulls uh, from which the starch has been used up, but the protein is still intact. It makes an excellent food for chickens. Um, I feed them worms, I feed them, um, I fed them live crawfish, all sorts of stuff. Uh, they, oh, they're, if you have a problem with cockroaches, chickens, <laughs> chickens are, are your answer. Uh, no, okay, so we built this thing called a, a roach trap. And basically what we did is took a three liter soda bottle and we cut the top off of it and then inverted it and stuck it back, back down inside the bottle and coated the inside of the bottle with vegetable oil and put a little bit of molasses in the bottom. So the roaches come and they smell that molasses and they crawl inside the bottle and because the sides of it are coated with oil, they can't climb out. So they just fall on the bottom and eventually die. And the only thing that attracts more roaches than the smell of molasses is the smell of other dead roaches. So pretty soon this whole container is going to fill up with dead cockroaches. And at that point you can take it outside and shake it out for your chickens and they will just gobble them up. They sure love to eat molasses coated dead roaches. Yeah, no, no need to sip poisons. Just, you've, got, you've got chicken food. We've always joked about wanting to have like a chicken on night patrol in the kitchen just to eat all the roaches that come out at night, which you know in Texas are just sort of this fact of life that you have to deal with. Um, so a lot of people, particularly people who live in, in high density cities, a lot of folks in Manhattan, you know, all they have is an apartment, they don't have access to any land, they're not part of a, an urban garden, and they say, you know, what is something I can do to contribute to my own self-reliance? And the thing I most commonly recommend is to have something called a worm box, which is basically just a plastic bin 
that contains a type of worm called the red wiggler, which is a worm. It's, it's different from the kind of worms that you would find in garden soil. That, the garden soil worm prefers a high mineral environment. This worm prefers a high nutrient environment, like you would find in, in a compost pile. But it is capable of eating about equal to its own weight in food every other day or so. Uh, it can take uh, vegetable scraps. It likes soft things like fruit scraps and vegetable scraps. It doesn't do as well with meat and dairy or oily cooked products, but vegetable scraps it does quite well with. And we'll turn them into this, these, what are called the castings. It's the worm's poop, which is just black gold for gardeners. It's an incredibly nutrient and microbially rich fertilizer that can be put into gardens, you can uh, put it into to house plants, even if you don't have a garden yourself, you can give it to a friend who has it. Um, this, having a worm box will not smell if you are doing it correctly. If it starts to smell, that's an indication that you're putting in too much food and you need to back off. But it's something that's small enough that you can stick it beneath the sink, on top of a refrigerator. Great thing for urban residents to do. Um, No, it's got a tight sealed lid that keeps the worms in and keeps flies and other things out. It, although it is, it is important to mention that it is ventilated, it has screen, which is very important. Um, so this is the new weird thing that I'm really into right now, uh, which is called. Um, yeah, let's 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 have a little tutorial on flies. Um, this right here is called the black soldier fly. This is different from your common pesky house fly, for a number of reasons. Well, it's a, it's a totally different species of fly, but as an adult, it doesn't eat. In fact, it doesn't even have a mouth. The reason, well, one of the main reasons that why house flies have gotten such a bad rep is the fact that they are often responsible for transmitting disease, because they land on poop, and then they land on food, and disease is then transmitted onto humans. The black soldier fly, on their hand, has no interest in food. It, it only lives for a few days as an adult, it breeds, and then it dies. Um, it also does not even come into homes, so it will not transmit disease. Its larvae, however, are ravenous eaters, and they're capable of eating a whole different class of food waste that red wigglers in a worm box are not. They can eat putrefying meat and cheese and all sorts of post-consumer waste that comes from restaurants that worms will not be able to touch, and again, break it down into a very rich and valuable fertilizer. In fact, you can take the castings that are left over by these guys and give it to your worms, your red wigglers, and they will sort of give it a final polish and make it super clean stuff. These guys, um, I'm not into promoting products at all, I'll say that, but I, I recently got this thing called the Biopod, which is this plastic shell that these um, larvae, it's designed to contain these larvae where you put your food waste in there and they'll eat it. And then they crawl up a ramp and fall through this bucket, at which point you can collect them and feed them to chickens. They're just fabulous protein for chickens. Which is sort of what the game of chickens is about, is like taking waste and inaccessible types of protein, the waste being the food waste, and then inaccessible like bugs and seeds, things that if we were to go around and collect and eat, we would use much more calories than we would get in return from them. But the chickens just do that naturally, so it's no biggie for them. And then they convert it into the highly assimilable egg <laughs> for us. So I'm going to experiment with the black soldier fly. Oh, and as a little side note, apparently they are as much as 50% oil by weight. So there's been some interesting research lately into oh pressing the oil out of the larvae. We will soon see the maggot mobiles on the road. <laughs> have I eaten them? No, I, I personally have not. They're quite good. Oh yeah? Just make sure they're dead. Because they can actually survive inside your GI tract. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, that is in the book. So another great thing for urban residents to do is raise edible and medicinal mushrooms on logs. Well, why is this something that's great for cities? Well, gaining access to land is sort of the fundamental revolutionary question in itself. It's a huge topic and something we talk a lot about. But even if you are fortunate enough to actually get access to a plot of land, there's a very good chance that it never sees the sun.